Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of uh, Resilience here with your host, Brad Newfeld. This is the show where you will discover that every challenge that you face in life is conquerable, especially when we work together, because working together with other people creates a powerful thing. And uh, anyway, people need people. That's the best way I like to say it. But our guest today is Portia Lauder. Uh, Portia, I am so honored to have you on the show today. Uh, man, I'm, I'm so glad we crossed paths and were able to hook up because I love your story. Oh, thank you, Brad. I love it. Uh, but our guest today is Portia Lauder. Uh, she began her career actually documenting weddings as a photographer, and she became involved in real estate, and this was back in 2005, and was indicted for mortgage fraud. Okay, we're going to get into this, and it's like, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll get into it. This is, uh, it's not what it seems. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> okay, well, Portia had left her family, her husband, Chad, and five children in Utah and spent four and a half years in a federal prison, both in California and in Minnesota. And while she was in prison, she gained a new insight and a new purpose and perspective on life. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, today in, in great detail. Uh, she recently launched her book, uh, describing her experiences. Uh, Portia currently lives in Highland, Utah, and with her husband, Chad, and and her uh, children and grandchildren. How many grandchildren do you have now? We have two grandchildren and one on the way. Aren't they great? <laughs> Nobody, it doesn't even matter how many times people tell you how cool it is. It's just cooler than that. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> All right. Well, she's currently working with women uh, who struggle with trauma and addiction. And so we're going to get into those things too, but her book is Living Louder, A Compassionate Journey Through Federal Prison. So Portia, tell us a little bit about what started all that. I like, I don't know how far back you want to go, but uh, I, I like to, on this show, pursue people's intent. Because again, we all have our, our journeys in life. And uh, let's start maybe in your high school years where you're thinking, okay, I have a certain perspective on life maybe. And and what led you to where you're at right now? Okay, yeah, thank you, Brad, for the opportunity to be here. Um, I was a um, a rebellious teenager, to be honest. I, no. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the oldest of seven kids, and I was spicy. That's the word my kids use now, spicy. Spicy, but, okay, uh, I like it. <laughs> but anyway, um, and I have some leadership skills, and so, you know, being the oldest in that family, but the thing that I, as I look back at my life, I realized I just didn't know my worth. I didn't know who I was at that point in my life. And I lived in a small town and I wanted to have children. And I got, um, I started as a mother young. I was 17 when I had my first child, okay. um, had two children by the time I was 21 and was a single mother living with my mm. parents. So that was um, the first time that I realized that it was going to take some strength to change my life, that I had to make a conscious choice to make things different. And uh, it didn't come easy. I'm not going to go into all the details. There was um, an addiction involved. I got involved in the 12-step the program, and that helped me a lot. Um, I started listening to other people, which was a really good thing to do for the first time in my life. Yes. <laughs> I figured I didn't know everything. And when I was about 26, um, I had, I'm also a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and, but wasn't active in that church from the time I was 13 on up, and really didn't have a relationship, you know, even outside religion with God. I didn't understand what role that would play in my life until I got into my 20s as a mother with children and my life not being where I had hoped or even thought it might be. And I found that relationship through this mm. support group. I found something greater than myself that I could turn to and my life changed. And that was, um, I started to gain a little confidence in myself. And I good. married a good man who adopted my children mm. and life was pretty good for us. Uh, we bought a home, which was like this big to do for us. And I started a photography business and it was growing and doing well. And um, I remember being very grateful that I, you know, because there was so much of my years that were difficult that I appreciated every day, the simplicity and the beauty of my life. Mm. And as life got busier, we started having children and um, I had a back surgery and I relapsed on prescription drugs. And that was so challenging because I had come so far. I mean, it had been five years that I had been involved in this program and it was embarrassing and I let my pride get in the way. And I, I tried to go back to meetings, but I didn't get really honest with myself about those challenges. And 
Um, and then real estate was booming at that time. It was like about 2005 and you could buy a lot and flip the lot and make money at it. And um, okay, and how'd you get started in it? Just somebody mentioned something? Did you see like a yeah, so commercial it, on TV or something? No, I moved, I moved to Highland. We mm -hmm. built a home. We saved money, you know, in our career, what we were doing and we built a home and it was in Highland. And there were other people that were building spec homes at that time, just a home to sell for profit. Mm -hmm. And I was looking to do that as well. And I ran into some investors who told okay. me, this is what you can do. And they're called equity deals. So you buy a house, you pull the mm -hmm. money out, you invest it in something else. And I honestly was pretty naive. Like I didn't yeah. know much about it, but I'm such a go-getter. Like as soon as they explained, the first time they explained it to me, I was like, hmm, I don't know about that. Wait yeah, a minute, so, why would you yeah. borrow more money than a house is worth, you know? Yeah. <laughs> But then I was like, wait a second, I can make this much money. These guys are smart. They're doing that. They, yeah, they're they, doing they're it. They're, than me. they're doing it. And also one of the motivations for me was I was working a lot and I had all these children. I mean, I had at that point, I had two young ones. My older ones were in middle school. And because my younger years were hard, I really wanted to be home with my kids. But financially, you know, I married a man with two children and it was not like he just had all the money to support a family. So we were like doing it together. Yeah. And I thought, well, I could, if I could just pay down our house, I wouldn't have to work, which is, you know, I know now most people in prison have good intentions, but we yeah. go about it the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So and that's, that's what, what I've noticed too. And working with people over the years too, there, you know, yeah, there's people in prison that should be in prison and should never get out. Absolutely. But what would you say percentage wise, probably 90% are people that are just like yeah. situations that you're describing now? Yeah, I would say 90% yeah. are either people that are really poor and haven't had the best examples and do, yeah. you know, and or people that yeah, make mistakes and get caught. <laughs> yeah, because that's what I noticed. So yeah. So but anyway, as I um as I got involved in it, my addiction, I didn't get the help I needed. And eventually the FBI started investigating me. And I really struggled, you know, at first I just begged them, please, please don't do this. I, I worked so hard for this family, you know? It's yeah. so scary. Like nobody so, wants the FBI to show up. I don't even care if you've so ever this done just, anything wrong. This just, just happened out of the blue. You just got a knock on your door? Kind of, I mean, okay. I had a little bad luck. So my name is Portia and there was another Portia in Utah who was investing in real estate, but she was under investigation. <laughs> so our oh. names were getting crossed. It's such an unusual name, you know? Okay. Yeah. And uh, so the FBI started looking at, <laughs> I know. And I was like, what, why mm -hmm. are you looking into me? Well, they thought I was, we were working as like a, you know, as a duo or pr I was pretending to be her. We just, they couldn't figure it out. So they started investigating, but, um, yeah. And then they just continued to investigate and said, you know, it took years. And so that was the other problem. Um, it wasn't just a cut and dry case for them. You know, I explained right. to them what I was doing. I had attorneys. So, I mean, I was, I, I still was very much convinced that I wasn't doing anything illegal, but I was scared. I was just right. scared, you know, right. I wasn't in the best place um, because I was using prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. And because um, I think deep down, I just knew that I was involved in things that I shouldn't be. And it was scary. And nobody just likes the FBI to show up, even if you're not. No. Like my neighbors no. that weren't even involved in real estate, they would go and ask them questions and they just look at me like, what have you done? You know, yeah. nobody wants to talk to the FBI. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I fought it. I begged them. I, you know, I hired new attorneys. I, and I think um, I probably made it a little harder on myself than it had to be. You know, I probably would have gotten less time, but because it took so long, by the time I was sentenced, the judge was just determined he was going to give me the maximum sentence. And so I look back at my life and I say, you know, I could have done some things different, um, but I'm here now. So yeah, that's where I'm at. <laughs> mm. So anyway, it so was then the court, so then the court process started because you, where you started in 2005, and when did the court process actually start? When did this whole thing with the FBI? Right. Okay, yeah. they came around um, shortly thereafter. I remember the first real visit was, I started hearing about it and them talking to other people. And then in mm -hmm. 2007, when my baby girl, my youngest one was born, they showed up at our house because I remember holding her, she was a few months old. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, they basically said, it's happening. We're going to indict her. You know, they told my husband that and me and it's, she, you know, and, and I was like, wait. 
there's got there was no wiggle room with that it right. was just they they need so many indictments my name was on the list it was happening and i they i kept hearing things like it's not personal i'm like it is personal well it's absolutely personal. Ab absolutely <laughs> what, what a stupid thing for them to say <laughs> <laughs> like it's so personal maybe not for yeah. you and your job but for me it's personal right but i i mean i wish i could have looked at it more objectively but i wasn't there at that point so but yeah. anyway um so after that i was invited in 2010 i i had heard about it so you imagine there's three years there from 2007 to 2010 that the FBI is kind of coming around and we're meeting, trying to get it resolved. And then in 2010, they indict. And then I hire attorneys and we're arguing and fighting and going back and forth. And then in 2014, I was scheduled to go to trial. And I share this in my book. Um, three weeks before I was there at the courthouse when a shooting happened. And mm -hmm. that was traumatic. On top yeah, of talk about that just for a second, because you were in the courtroom and all of a sudden right. you hear shots. I read this in your book. So, <laughs> right. yeah, so I'm in the courtroom and all of a sudden marshals come running through with guns. You hear gunshots. Well, we heard gunshots and then they came running through and the judge is like, well, that doesn't happen every day. And she clears the courtroom, <laughs> you know, and for some reason I end up going out the front door with the paramedics and mm -hmm. everyone else is locked in. And then the re news reporters come up to me and say, what happened? And the only thing I knew was that the the man in the courtroom next door had a pencil in his hand, which doesn't seem like a very dangerous weapon to me. I'm right. like, why don't you shoot him five times and kill him? You know, it was yeah. just a, so in my mind, I'm just getting very paranoid because I've been going through this process for a long time. And I'm like, you know, that happened. My trial was impending. There were just so many things going on. And um, I started breaking down mentally. I just couldn't mm. take it. It was too scary. Really yeah. bad you know, all of it. And so they incarcerated, well, they put me in a, in a county jail and the treatment was, was terrible. It really was. It was traumatic. Um, they took my clothes. They said I pushed an officer. I don't remember it, but it could have happened. You know, yeah. I was, um, but I was stripped in front of male officers. I was pinned down. I had some injuries and was held for 11 days and then um, transferred in chains and shackles with other inmates. And I was very confused, you know, I didn't understand what was going on. Yeah. So when I got to the place where they did the mental evaluation and they explained to me why I was incarcerated that, and you know, I was undergoing a mental evaluation at that point, I was able to make some sense of what was going on. And they, they diagnosed me um, mentally competent to stand trial. But, okay. you know, addiction, some other things that I struggled with. And then they sent me back to Utah. And when I got to the federal courthouse, and this was over several months. So this whole mm -hmm. time I'm being transferred and it's traumatic. It's extremely yeah, traumatic. You I'm know? sure. But when I got back, uh, my lawyer said the judge is going to court order them to give you schizophrenia medication at the jail. And I said, I'm so lost. I'm not schizophrenic. I can't, right. you know, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse here. And I said, right. if I plead guilty, and you have to imagine, I haven't even pled guilty yet. So mm -hmm. I'm being held as an innocent woman and treated like this. So at this point, I'm thinking I am completely done for. Like mentally, I'm not going to be able to hold it together. And I just need to plead guilty, you know, mm. which was probably the worst time for me to plead guilty. I mean, if my lawyers could have made a deal and, you know, but I just pled to what they had on the table to get out. They let me out that day. So they said that I was incompetent. So I had to stay in jail. But as soon as I pled guilty, they said I was competent and let me out. <laughs> so it's like, you're, you guys are not playing fair. <laughs> <laughs> so I got out and, um, and then I, I had a few months until I had to go get sentenced. And the day that I was sentenced was, I shared in the book, it was a real, um, it was like a death. It just changed everything for me. It was yeah, like, I bet. It was like a death. I'm leaving my family. I will um, never be the same person again. The world just changed. I'll never see things the same. And mm -hmm. the judge gave me the maximum sentence. Um, but for some reason, I was able to, I mean, I prayed. I, there's not some reason. I prayed and asked for strength. I felt very alone. I think everyone feels that way when you're in a courtroom. It's like you with the United States of America. You know, you're like, I'm the little you guy. You versus the United States of America. Wow. I'm, it's like, I'm just so little. I don't understand. Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> it's a bad place to be. Because uh -huh. uh, I'm pretty sure they can take countries out. So I'm I'm done for, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was that kind of an experience. But I And the maximum sentence they gave you at the time was like seven years or something like that? Yeah. It was a seven year sentence. And oh my gosh. At that point, I thought maybe I'd get a year, but it was like I knew when I walked in the courtroom that I would get the maximum sentence. Wow. So that was a life changer. Um, 
I was fortunate. My husband, the judge um, didn't have a lot of compassion for me at that point. I asked for compassion for my family. And if he would give me the time, eight weeks to self-surrender. And he said no to me. But with my husband, um, my husband stood up and pled on my behalf. And that was a very tender experience. So he was able to um, reach the judge in a different way. And the judge agreed. And so I was fortunate. I got that eight weeks to say goodbye to my children. It changed everything. I, you know, it was heart wrenching for me to say goodbye. Um, but I like the topic of your podcast because what I learned is that um, resilience is um, maybe one of the most important attributes that we can have in each yes. situation. It doesn't mean we won't have to walk through the hard things. Yeah. It just means that when we do, we keep a tender heart and allow it to transform us in a positive way and not hardness, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, each step of my journey, I was blessed. I was blessed with people in prison, support in my community. Um, there were days that I literally was curled up in a ball on my bunk, begging God to protect my kids, crying, aching for the loss of my children. Um, it was painful for me to accept. I felt very victimized for quite a while. I didn't think it was fair. I got the maximum, you know, um, the there were just other people did things they should have, they got away with that were worse. I mean, there were all those thoughts. Yeah. So I wanted to leave prison free. I wanted, you know, I made this deal with myself that I was going to do everything I could to leave an amazing person. Which so if you don't mind, if it's not too painful, if not, if, if it is, we don't have to go there, but you, so you went to the courtroom, the judge was able to give you the eight weeks. So you had a, that little bit of time to adjust versus just getting, Right. you know, run off and thrown into prison. So, so right. you got that. And so you took, uh, you were able to, when you, that first day you got there and you heard those bars <laughs> slam behind you, what, that was the time you said you were curled up in a ball and yeah. just, um, it took me four days of laying on a bunk. And I, I, I don't even know if I, there were times that I had tears, but there were times that I physically was so physically sick. Mm -hmm. I felt um, such devastation. It was like an immediate um, shock because you mm -hmm. walk away from everything. The, the, right. the community or the environment is so different. It's, it's cold. It's cement. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. you, you, you know, one of the guards would always call us degenerates. I mean, it's just, it's just different. I mean, they, and they, they're jaded for a reason. I mean, the officers have their reasons, whatever, but yeah. for me to go from a loving community, I mean, I've lived in Utah my whole life. People are like, even, even when I made mistakes, my community was like, you can do this. We're here behind you. And I walk into this and there's a lot of pain in prison, you know, yeah. there's people who have suffered. And I just said in my cell and this woman that was in my cell with me, my roommate, she just kept saying, you have to move. You have to get up. They'll put you in the medical unit. You'll never, you won't recover. Like she kept saying, and I go, go away. Don't talk to me. Please. Yeah. Just leave me alone. It hurts just too I much. Can imagine. I can't, I can't and even that's how I would have been. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so hard, yeah. you know? And she kept saying, you're going to be okay. I go, please, you have to eat. No, I don't want anything. I want you to leave me alone. Like I just yeah. didn't want to talk to anyone. I couldn't imagine when I looked around in this yeah. cold world, in my opinion, at that point, everyone wearing khakis, no color, no smiles. I felt so alone. And I, I missed my kids and ached in a way that I just, I thought, how am I going to do this for a day, let alone seven years? It was impossible. Uh, and mm -hmm. um, it took, numerous different experiences it took you know one day at a time um but i found something to hold on to and it, and you know after about four days i i went outside and i just sat on a table and cried and a lady there kept telling me you're going to be okay the pain will go away you're going to be okay i didn't even know this woman you know yeah. her life was much more challenging than mine mm -hmm. and for her to try to support me and help me through it um, and finally I went to the track and I just had a very stern and serious conversation with myself and just okay. said, you have to stop Portia. You're feeling sorry for yourself and you're not helping yourself. You're here. You need to do better than this. You have yeah. children and people who depend on you. You have to find the best in this. You can't let this ruin you. And that's the resilience moment where you decide, is this going to destroy me or is it going to make, am I going to let it make me a better person? And it's painful but yeah. I found something to hold on to. And I, I continued, you know? Yeah. Well, I like how you said that you decided, uh, yeah. this is one of the things we preach constantly on this show. It, it really changes hard. I mean, as you, as you know, <laughs> uh, 
change yeah. <laughs> change is hard, whether it's forced upon us or whether we do it uh, willfully. Uh, but but the thing is, is it does. It takes a decision, and when you finally reach that point, because how long did it take you to get there? Like a couple of weeks before you finally said, "No, I've got to change." Yeah, it took like, a okay. couple of weeks before I really even ventured to go look at anything, or you know. But at that point, I realized this has to come from me. Like I have to find something inside myself. I need to find a strength that I don't, I mean, I got to dig deep. I got to find something here because I had never been in such a hard situation, you know? Yeah. So I had to find something because that kind of pain can break you. I mean, and it does, there are people that are mentally, yeah. I mean, the trauma of going to prison, it's trauma for everybody. You know, it's yeah. such a shock, yeah. but, um, but there are people that don't recover from that, you know, and yeah. I didn't want to be one of those people. So yeah. Okay. So then what did you do with you? So you made the decision. No, I'm not going to let this break me. I'm, I, I want to make the, yes, I'm here. Yeah. How can I make I, the best of this? Yeah. So, okay. um, I, I actually remembered a, a therapist who I had spoken to before I went to prison who told me, yes, Portia, it would be very hard to go to prison. Cause I was like, I can't go. You don't understand. Like yeah. I can't do it. This wasn't in my life plan. No, I think it's that I go to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, deep down, you know, I'm like, I don't want to live my life running. I have children. I can't do that. But I have, I can't go. And he just said to me, you know, Portia, it would be very hard to go to prison. But the truth is, I've seen people struggle with addiction for seven years and be disconnected from their family. And in prison, you would be able to still become an amazing person. And in, and in your addiction, you couldn't. And just wow. that word, it was so powerful to me. It wow, was like, that is powerful. That just yeah. sent a shiver down my spine. Wow. Yeah, it, it was a so much truth point. in that. Yeah. And so I went back to the unit and I wrote a list of things I could do to become an amazing person. And that yeah. guided me for four and a half years. I, every time I went to be angry, I'd say, do amazing people get angry? Do amazing people feel sorry for themselves? You know? And, I, and the, my list was like, be a good friend, be a good mother, be a good listener, read and study, be disciplined. You know, all the things that I had been neglecting because I had been in survival mode for so long fighting my case that it was like, I have this time. I need to make the best of it. Here's my list. And I, every morning I would get up and I would think and imagine myself all the positive things I was going to do in my future. Like I would see my life, the kind of mother I was going to be, the kind of influence I wanted to be on others, you know, the kind of sister and daughter and all the positive things I would do with my life. And that I held on to it and that guided me and it gave me something to fight for. And so yeah. I'm so grateful for that therapist. And I'm so grateful that early on in my sentence, I found something to hold on to and I'm passionate about it. So now I'm like, I'm helping some um, nonprofits that are trying to, Re change education in prison. I actually wrote a whole curriculum about around becoming an amazing person while I was in prison to help girls fight, to find their why, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it, I learned so much from that experience because I had four and a half years to practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the end, it, I didn't care if I was an amazing person. I just found out how amazing all the women in prison were. And that was the beauty of the whole thing was that my whole perspective had changed. Like I had met these amazing people who changed my life. And when I walked in, I didn't see that at all. So my whole view oh. changed and it was right. Beautiful, you know, so. Okay. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to get into that a little bit more, but let's take a quick break. Yeah. Uh, and when we come back, uh, let's, let's delve into that a little bit more. Cause I, I know in your book, you described, uh, uh I'd like to hear about too tall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the coolest. Yeah, yeah, that's the coolest. So, so, so anyway, we're going to be right back. Our guest today is Portia Louder. She's the author of the book "Living Louder: A Compassionate Journey uh, Through Federal Prison." Oh, the, your your book is awesome. I I am just so impressed. But we'll get into that a little bit more here in this second segment. Uh, but we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Tamara K. Anderson, and I want to share something special with you. When our son Nathan was diagnosed with autism, I felt like the life we had expected for him was ripped away and with it, my own heart shattered as well. It's very common for families to feel anger, pain, confusion, and anxiety when a child is diagnosed. This is where my book, Normal For Me, comes into play. It shares my story of learning to replace my pain with acceptance, peace, joy, and hope. Normal for Me has helped change many lives, and I'd like to give this book to as many families as possible. We've put together something I think is really special. 
My friends and listeners can order copies of my book at a significantly discounted price, and we will send them to families who have just had a child diagnosed with autism or another special needs diagnosis. We will put your name inside the cover so they will know someone out there loves them and wants to help. I will also sign each copy. You can order as little as one or as many as hundreds to be shared with others. So go to my website, TamaraKAnderson.com, and visit the store section for more information and to place your order. You can bless the lives of many families by sending them hope, love, and peace. Check it out today at TamaraKAnderson.com and help me spread hope to the world. Welcome to the Resilience Talk Network. My name is Jay Walter, and I'm the host of Rebuilding. Heard every weekday night from 6 to 7 p.m. You can listen in and learn how to face your fears, overcome obstacles, and make dreams a reality. So listen every weekday night from 6 to 7 p.m. right here on the Resilience Talk Network. I hope you're enjoying our our show today with uh, with our guest, a special guest, Portia Louder. Wonderful story! Oh my gosh, I can't wait to get uh, back into it and uh, hear a little bit more about her experiences while she was there in prison and the wonderful people she was able to meet. You're really going to love this next segment, uh, even though it's not created yet. Uh, <laughs> we're about to jump back into it, but I just want to talk about one of our sponsors. Uh, our sponsor uh, for this show is Affiliate Solar. And if you've never uh, delved into solar, but it's been something you've been thinking about, hey, it can save you a lot of money on your utility bills. And so my buddy, uh, J.D. Greenhall down at Affiliate Solar, he'll hook you up. Uh, the thing I like about J.D. is he's not one of those pushy guys, because I know a lot of times uh, people will have questions on things like they like this with the solar, but it could be cars, it could be anything else, but you're afraid to reach out because of those bad experiences you've had in the past of being uh, railroaded by, oh no, I'm being forced into buying something I don't want to do. JD is not that guy. He's very knowledgeable about the uh, the solar uh, the solar world and all of the different uh, panels that are available and all the different systems that are available, and he can get, uh, talk to you about it in great detail. Uh, the other thing about the solar system, the solar uh, panels right now. There's many tax incentives. And again, I don't want to get into exactly what those are. I'll let JD explain them. But there are ways that a lot of it can be paid for through the tax incentives that you'll be able to get because uh, with the uh, the government going in their way with green energy and stuff like that, they are giving a lot of uh, tax uh, rebates and things like that for the solar panels. So you might be able to get into it for a lot cheaper than you think. But reach out to my buddy J.D. Greenhall at area code 801-822-2918. Again, that's 801-822-2918. J.D. Greenhall along, uh, at uh, Affiliate Solar, and he'll hook you up. Well, here we go. Let's jump back into our interview with Portia Louder. All right, and we're back with our guest today, Portia Louder. Uh, Portia is the uh, is the author of the book, Living Louder, A Compassionate Journey Through Federal Prison. And uh, wow, the first segment on this was very enlightening, Portia. <laughs> uh, again, I, I'm laughing with you, not at you because of your experience here. I hope you know that. Because <laughs> uh, the way that you've been able to change your attitude about this whole thing and make the best of it is just impressive to me. And, and I want to thank you for that, because I think this uh, interview here is going to help a lot of people in our audience. I really do. So, so thank you for sharing as much as you are, but let's, let's get in again. So by now, at this point, you're, you're there, you're in prison, you've come to the conclusion and made the decision that, you know what, I'm here, I'm going to make the best of it. Tell us a little bit about your experiences in there. I know, uh, I know you had mentioned in your book, something about uh, getting a job in there and the, your first experience wasn't so good or something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's all these little hacks that people should know about prison if you're going Hopefully you're yeah. not, but if you do, you need to find a job because if you don't, they will assign you. And I didn't want to work in the kitchen. I didn't know I didn't want to work in the kitchen until I got there. 
but mm-hmm. the communication style was pretty tough for me. <laughs> the yeah. girls would say, you need to tell her to F off. And I said, what? I don't understand. But the officers, they talk pretty harsh to the inmates and the inmates talk harsh back. And mm-hmm. so um, I didn't care for that style of communication. Um, I had one lady, she's like, are you stupid? What's wrong with you? And I'm like, what? Why did you say that? I just didn't know what I was doing. You have to show me how, you know? But in the end, um, by the end of my sentence, I didn't have those kinds of challenges because I understood what I was dealing with. But early on, you know, I'm still learning. And so um, I was fortunate. I worked in the kitchen. And then after I went over and volunteered in the education department. And in time, they saw that I was, you know, somebody that had some, the ability to help people with their GEDs. And they actually gave me a lot of freedom to put together a, curric- a curriculum of photography class. It nice. Class- yeah, that was amazing because I could teach something I was passionate about. Um, I also taught classes on resumes and goal setting and things that were that I was working on, you know, my goal setting and, and visualizations and things like that. So I started teaching those things. And, you know, and when you're teaching, I found a purpose is what happened. But in the but also one of the things that happened for me is I really um once I kind of accepted that I was living there, this was where I was living. <laughs> this is yeah. my home for now, right. you know? And, right. and so I started getting to know people and that was amazing. You mentioned before the, the break, too tall. You know, the, here's this woman that you might think would be imposing. She's probably six, two, six, three, you know? Mm-hmm. She, um, she's a black woman. She mm-hmm. is uh, poor. She's been, you know, lived very poor in California throughout her life. One mm-hmm. of the most tender hearted kind but strong women that I met and she right away she just put her arm around me and said come on baby girl let's go get you a laundry spot and nobody <laughs> thought, nobody even looked twice they're like oh too tall wants you to get a laundry because I'm like those girls over there look scary how do I get a laundry spot she goes you better go over and tell them I'm like I don't know what I'm doing you know yeah. she's like I got you let's go <laughs> right <laughs> so I was fortunate um and I always felt so comforted I'd go she I mean she'd be in the day room cross-stitching she was kind she was a good listener yet yeah. if you saw her you know if you didn't know her and you saw her in prison you'd think oh she's a bad person she deserves it and it wasn't like that at all yeah um, it wasn't she was raised very poor she mm-hmm. worked at a Burger King she had a man that you know abused her for years and she ended up getting pregnant and and he told her go get an abortion you know you're not my problem and she chose to have him and take care of him herself and she was trying to support a kid and she ended up dealing drugs. You know, she said that where I live, that's how you made more money than working at Burger King. And um, she got 10 years for it, but, and she wasn't bitter. She was like, well, this is what happens to people like me, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I loved her and I still do, you know, I met so many women like that, that were poor, that were kind to me, that had yeah. nothing did nothing on the outside and they would support me and help me. And I had everything. I had a family and community. And so it, it, once I was able to take a look at the fact that my circumstances, I was very privileged in, in comparison to most people in prison, it changed things for me. And um, I was able to have more gratitude, which is a, you know, a very positive, affirming type of emotion and compassion for others, which was my gift to be able to yeah. truly see people and, and understand and know who they really were was my blessing. So. Well, I know, I know prison can be a very scary experience. I've heard that from many, many yeah. people, but uh, I, I just see that as your, your family's prayers and your prayers were being answered that, that God yeah. gave you somebody to, you know, yeah. <laughs> protect you, so to speak. Did you feel every, that way about it? Or? Every, yeah. Every step of the way I really did. Um, mm-hmm. You know, to walk into a prison, I had, two really good friends. One, one, her name was Patty and (laughs) she would, nobody messed with her. She worked in the kitchen and right away she saw me and she's just like, she was very supportive of me and still is like, she's still like sends me messages. I got your book. I'm, you know, I would back you up to the end, you know, very loyal. Um, and then too tall. I had amazing roommates. I I just have so much love for these women, you know, Mm -hmm. and each step of the way I, man, when I got transferred, I met people that were so supportive and loving. Um, I met people that were strong that would, when I was breaking, they would, you know, they would point out all the positives and lift me up. And um, I know that the prayers of my community and my family were with me. I have a lot of faith and 
I felt very connected to God throughout that. There's people that have that go in and volunteer and say, you'll never feel a better, a, a stronger connection. I will tell you this. I learned because I lived in Utah my whole life. So the religion, the predominant religion in Utah is, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I yes. was the only member and yeah. I prayed with Buddhists and Catholics and and there was no difference. We were sisters. So when I, I had actually, I went to church headquarters shortly after I got home, they asked me to give them some insight on what they could do to better support people incarcerated. And they said, well, what did the Relief Society do? What did, and I said, we were all sisters. I was the only member. I uh -huh. didn't see, you know, like you don't, I had so much support there from people who had nothing, who were all different mm -hmm. religions. And that's never left me. Like it does to me, God is working in everyone's life, regardless of your religion. And even if you're an atheist, he's working your life. You may not see him, but he's there, <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and we're just all on this journey and trying to figure out what comes next. And we really are so connected. Our, yeah. our souls and spirits are connected. And I believe I, that as well. Yeah. We, so I can't hurt someone without it coming back to me. And when I lift someone else, it lifts me too. Absolutely. And I learned, I learned that in prison. So so you ended up getting your uh, sentence shortened, so you didn't have to stay yeah. the first seven years. Yeah, so okay, how did that happen? Yeah, how did yeah, that so, all happen? Well, so I spent my first year in California, and they transferred me mainly because I was writing. I wrote while I was in prison on a blog, and it made them uncomfortable. But it was my blessing because I went to Minnesota, which was frustrating, right? Yeah. At the time, I'm like, "Are you kidding? I didn't do yeah. anything." <laughs> I like, can't do anything Ooh. right. <laughs> right, right. But but Minnesota was right where I needed to be. Um, yeah. It was a different vibe there. And I had a lot of support and it just, it just worked out for me. But anyway, right. um, they offered me RDAP. My judge had ordered it just because my judge ordered it. I didn't want it. I was mad, you know, just anything mm. he wants. I don't want, <laughs> but uh, I ended up going and I got a year off my sentence and that was a huge blessing. And I learned a lot while I was in that program. So that, that worked out for me. And then I did everything I could to minimize my time. You know, I took every class I served, um, I prayed. And even in the end, um, you can minimize your time by coming back to Utah early and staying at a halfway house. I did that. Um, and things just worked out for me. So you can do some of those things. It, I had good time because I didn't have any infractions or anything. So it worked out that I ended up serving four and a half years of my sentence. Okay. So then you get out. How was that? I mean, hard. <laughs> so hard. I mean, change I'm, is hard. I'm, I'm telling I you, it's hard. Change is so hard. Um, I, you know what's crazy? By the time I got out of prison, I thought this world is a weird world. I want to go back. Like <laughs> there was such a connection because we didn't have social media. We weren't sitting there on our phones. Like. We were there for each other, you know. If someone thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were there for each other. So when someone was hurting, we would circle around him and pray. Or if we knew what everyone was going through, you know, we had a girl that her brother committed suicide, and she was on the phone sobbing, and we all just got around her and prayed for her and lifted each other up. And we were, she was in her room crying, and everybody went to their locker and found one thing they could give her, and we filled her room full of stuff just to help her, just to let her know she was loved those experiences were so beautiful. And when I got home, I was like, wait, my neighbors don't even know me. Like they live all the way over there. <laughs> you know, it was so hard. And that's yeah. why I went to work at a treatment center. I needed that connection. Um, okay. I will, as soon as they'll let me back in a prison, I'll be in a prison. I mean, they yeah. won't let me go for another few months, but as soon as I get, can, I'll be there and I'll be serving because I love those women. Yeah. And so that's what you're dedicating your, your time to now. Yeah. Uh, okay. And Any so uh, well, let's talk about the book first, if that's okay. How did that happen? And yeah. if you could just kind of describe the writing process, what you went through for that. Yeah. So I'm, I, I wrote on a blog, so I had some content okay. and I also wrote letters and I kept all that stuff, you know? And mm -hmm. when I got home, people said, Oh, you should write a book. And I felt so intimidated by that. Like I, there was no way I thought me write a book. Like that's overwhelming. I'm not college educated. I'm a reader. I love to read. So I read everything. I read the whole library out my first year. You know, I had to have more books sent in. So I, I would read 18 hours a day. I'd get up early just to read. So I love to read, but I'm not an, or, you know, I don't have the training in writing. And then one day, about a year after I got home, um, I actually, I read something that, and it just clicked for me that the way I could almost see it in my mind, the exact way I needed to write it. I could see the format, I could see the chapters. And so I wrote an outline and then I just started writing. 
And I literally wrote the first half of the book in about two months. I just wrote, I couldn't stop. It was like, I felt compelled to just write. It had to come out, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I was exhausted because there was so much love and emotion and heartbreak, leaving my kids, all that stuff to write it. I had to organize notes and things like that. And I did that while I was working at the treatment center. I worked a graveyard shift and every night I would just 12 hours and I would just, you know, start doing that. And then um, I took a two month break and I thought I will never write the other half ever. <laughs> It'll say here. I told one of my friends, she goes, you can't do that. You can't said, do that. You can't leave us hanging, Portia. Come on. I, had, I know I had, a, I had a really good friend who's a college professor and he, I wrote the first half and he goes, I said, I can't keep writing. He goes, you have to finish it. You can't yeah. leave it like this, you know? Yeah, and exactly. I, was grateful. I had a couple readers, so I would send the chapters over and editors and they would give me pointers. But at, for the most part, one thing I read that really helped me as I was looking at different publishers, I chose to go self-published at this point. I may eventually publish with a publisher, but at this point, um, I made that decision. But as I looked at different publishers' websites, one publisher from Canada said, you can overcome a lot with passion if you are writing from the heart and you are writing like, and you are sharing something so deep in your soul, that is the most powerful form of writing. And I thought, I got that. I got right. that. I, maybe I can't put everything together in a perfect flow, but man, do I have so much passion for what I'm sharing. Right. And I knew then that I could finish the book. So I yeah. finished it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? oh, so. yeah, you just have to, what, what's the term I've heard in the writer's community? Word vomit. Just yeah. put it, take everything out of your head and put it on you paper. You can sort it out there. later. Then you can go back there and clean it up. There's a process <laughs> to it. But yep. Every time, there were times I wrote a whole chapter in 15 minutes. Like I just felt so, I could envision it. And mm -hmm. I, there were times that I would just labor over it. But when that happened, it is the most beautiful thing for a writer to, to put something together and go, oh, I just did that. It's like a work yeah. of art, you know? It was so yeah. cool. And the, the beauty of the writing process, did you have that where you came up with other ideas for other things during the process? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that crazy? Because you're, you're focused on getting this book done exactly the way that you want it. And all of a sudden something else comes, whoa, maybe this, but it doesn't quite fit in my book. So right. maybe that's another one. Let me put that one on the shelf. And if you just keep the process going, it's amazing what your mind can create. So yeah, I, I the, some of the comments I get on the book at this point are, it just needs to be longer. I wanted more. And I'm like, well, I'll write another one. But that just had to end there. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, I, I had to do, you know, you yeah, and I, I was there. I was done. It was a very emotional story for me. You know, mm -hmm. it was my life. So mm -hmm. but another one will happen. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so how's things in the life of uh, Portia Lauder right now? So you've been out for how long? Two and a half years. Well, two and a half. almost two and a half. My life is so beautiful. It really awesome. is. Everything I dreamed about in prison has happened for me. I mean, I don't care about money and all that stuff, but I'm. what's so beautiful to me is to watch my children recovering and healing and becoming these amazing, compassionate people. Like their view of the world is so different because we went through this together, you know, to see their strength and resilience. I'm teaching them and that's beautiful. My life lived is their model, you know? And so I love that. Um, I get opportunities, you know, I love the women I work with in treatment. I'm still really close to all the women that I serve time with and they reach out to me on Facebook and I love them. I just cheer them on. And I think I'll spend the rest of my life in some way, shape or form in this sphere. You know, I have so many hopes and dreams to make changes, but not, not I don't wanna go up and, and fight the system. I wanna change people from the inside. I want their hearts and souls to change. And I want people out here to know how beautiful they are. I wanna connect the humanity that I found in prison with the humanity out here and change the world because I want people to see the beautiful things I saw. So I feel mm -hmm. a purpose in that. Um, and, you know, I'm closer to my parents. My dad's really sick right now. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's taught me so much. Um, I mean, I look at my parents so different, like everything in my life is so much more precious because of this. Yeah. So, yeah, oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's, that's just, that that's beautiful Portia. That, uh, had, talk about taking lemons and making lemonade <laughs> <laughs> and you did it with real sugar, you know, <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's take one more quick break. And when we come back, uh, let's talk about where people can uh, get into your world a little bit more, find out a little bit more about you, about how to get your book and, 
and any other things that you'd like to tell our audience today, Portia, we'd love to hear it. But our, our guest today is Portia Louder. She's the author of the book, uh, Living Louder, A uh, Compassionate Journey Through Federal Prison. Uh, we'll be right back to wrap things up. I'm author Richard Paul Evans. I have a new book out. It's called The Christmas Promise, and it's getting great reviews. Kirk has says, cozy up to this holiday treat. And Publishers Weekly writes, this enjoyable book packs an emotional punch. Of course, the only review that matters is yours. I hope you like it. You might even want to share it with your friends or book club. The Christmas Promise. It might make you cry, but in a good way. The Christmas Promise. Pick up your copies today. Do you know someone who's gambling with death due to an addiction? Do you know someone whose life is being turned upside down due to a loved one that's battling with addiction? Hi, I'm Al Richards. I am the host of the Other Side of Addiction podcast. I started the podcast due to my wife's battle with alcohol. Let's just say I became addicted to her addiction. Our podcast is helping people understand a little more about those who have battled addiction and those who are hurting from their addiction. Through raw vulnerability, we share stories that help uncover the root causes of addiction. Shame felt on both sides, matter of the conscious and subconscious mind, continued beliefs and often confusing paths of recovery. We collaborate with real people and their stories as well as licensed professionals to help our audience gain a better understanding of addiction. You can find us on Resilience Talk Network. You can also find us on Facebook at Mr. Al Richards. That's Facebook at Mr. Al Richards. You can also find us on YouTube. Just look up the Other Side of Addiction podcast. back here on, on Resilience with your host, Brad Newfeld. Our guest today is Portia Louder. Uh, Portia, we uh, have been talking about your book here, A Compassionate Journey Through Federal Prison. And if you're just coming in uh, on this interview audience, please go back and listen to the whole thing. You, you're, you're missing some really great stuff. And I've, I've been able to read your book. And wow, uh, wow, Portia, I, I love the detail that you go into. And I there's a lot of thought. This is my perspective on it. Anyway, you put a lot of thought into how your words can have the biggest impact. Maybe you didn't, maybe it was just, you're a natural writer and you were able to put that out there, but that's how it came across to me. Cause it, this is just how my brain works. I'm always, I, 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 I see patterns in things really quickly. And I, I started seeing that I'm going, Oh my gosh, you just know how to get that heart wrenching, you know, that share the stories in such a way that they just suck you in and you just want to know more. So anyway, you do, you did a great job on the book. So I just want to hats off to you there. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. So, so uh, anyway, tell us uh, how we, uh, Oh, let me ask you this first. What is uh, one word of advice or one sentence rather that, that you would like to tell our audience uh, as far as uh, now that you've been through all of this, what's something you can tell our audience that could help them in their lives? Yeah, thank you. I would say um, never give up. Never, okay. never, 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 ever. Because it, um, your life is so beautiful. You have so much to fight for. There is something right around the corner where you are right now. You can't imagine how good it's going to get. And you just don't know. And for me, right before things get amazing, they're the hardest. So if you're in something hard, it's only because something beautiful is right around the corner and your potential is enormous. So never give up on yourself. You don't know how many lives you're going to touch. You don't know how this experience is going to change the lives of others. Please know your future self is cheering you on. I'm cheering you on. The world is cheering you on. You have incredible potential and never give up. That was, yeah. that's what I want everyone to know because I have felt at my darkest and most impossible you know just this isn't how will i ever get out of this and my life today is so beautiful and i know that everybody's future is beautiful we just can't give up so. i know there was one person you mentioned in the book uh that um she had had a 
hard time uh, when she was 14. Her parents had died from an overdose and then she was just kind of by herself. And then she did some things that landed her in prison. And and that, that sentence where she said that, uh, you know, nobody even knows I'm here. Yeah. And yeah, that I, just that just struck me. I was uh, my heart went out to that lady. Yeah. And how's I, she doing now? She's doing well. I watch her and every time I see her, I get so excited. You know, mm. her um, that was such an uh, eye opening again and heart opening experience. There we are sitting in federal prison. It's Christmas. We're surrounded by bars. We're sitting on metal chairs. Yet the spirit that we felt connected you know, all of us different religions, and we're sitting there sharing our innermost heartfelt feelings. And for her, her worth and value of herself was so low that when she said a prayer, she thought, I'm nothing to anybody. I'm useless. I mean, she'd been, you know, treated really poorly, lived on the streets. Her parents were addicts. They died young. Everything that nothing had ever told her she mattered. Mm -hmm. So here we are sitting in this circle, and she shares this experience. And Basically, she said a prayer, God, if you know who I am, please let me know. And wow. a counselor came to her and said, there's a letter for you. Somebody's looking for you. She said, now I know I'm worth something. Just that letter changed it for her, you know, and she is, was taking classes and she left prison and got a job. And she is, I mean, what we can do for people when they yeah. don't know who they are to just see them and reach out to them changes everything. We have so much power to change each other's lives, you know? Yes, we do. But yeah. It, uh, yes, we do. it's pretty tough. There's a lot of people that don't know their worth in prison. And yeah. uh, I had no idea that that was the case. So, all right. Well, do you still have your blog or do you have a Facebook page? How can people get a hold of you? Yeah. Um, I have my blog. They can go to Portia louder.com. They can, the best way to reach me is Facebook. Facebook. I, yeah, I'm so connected on Facebook. It's Portia Wilcox louder. Wilcox is my maiden name. There's also Portia louder story. My blog is lawsunbroken.com, but, and we're trying to connect everything to um, just PortiaLauder.com. But here's what I want people to know. If you have a family member who is in prison or struggling, please message me. I will write them. If you have anybody that's going to prison, I get people all the time that reach out to me and say, what can I do? I want to help you. I want to support you. If you're looking to support people who are in prison, let me know, hit me up. I will. I am really good at reaching out back out to people. I have quite a few friends on Facebook. I try to bring in as many as I can. And some people just follow. Um, I have an Instagram account and I post occasionally on that. And that's just Portia Louder also on Instagram. But okay. the most important thing is send me a message. If you need help, please let me know. Cause I know some resources, you know, mostly I can just pray for you, support you and write family members if they're incarcerated. And sometimes just getting that letter from someone that's been through it makes all the difference, you know? So Absolutely. Yeah, let me know. I want to serve in that way any way I can. And I love getting messages and hearing people's stories and how they're doing. And we're in this together. So. And how can they get your book? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that. If you're interested, <laughs> you can go on Amazon. Um, right now it's on Amazon. Um, yes. There's some talk with some other places that it may be. But for today, the best way to do it is go to Amazon and look up Living Louder by Portia Louder and you will be able to get a copy. And, yep, and uh, you have it in the audible version. You have it in the in the Kindle version. version. So yeah. Yeah, you can you can get it anyway. I like that. <laughs> well, uh, Portia, thank you so much for coming on today. This has been enlightening. I know our our audience is going to love this uh, this episode here. So, but uh, we here at uh, Resilience Talk Network wish you the best and. And uh, the fact that you're able to take something again, the lemon here, uh, something that you went through that by world standards is very negative and 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 turn something good into it there. There are there's a lot of hurting people out there. And that's kind of the theme of our our station here with the with the word resilience, because, yes, resilience is overcoming the challenges of life and overcoming the things that you've gone through. But we're not done yet in this world. I mean, there's still a lot of challenges that we need to go through, but I just know if we pull together and, and work together and use each other's experiences to, to help each other, I just know it'll make it a lot more pleasant experience. <laughs> so Absolutely. anyway, thank you so much for having me. I'm just, Oh, thank you. Okay, everybody. Uh, again, our guest today has been Portia Louder, uh, author of the book, Living Louder, a compassionate journey through federal prison. And please uh, come back and see us again sometime. If you don't mind, let us know how things are going or how we can help you in any way. Will do. Thank you, Brad.
All right. So we're going to take one last break. I'll come back and wrap things up here on the show. But uh, anyway, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you in a minute. Hello there, this is Brad Newfeld with the Resilience Talk Network, and I would like to introduce to you Taffy Town, one of our newest sponsors. Let me introduce you to Derek. Hi, I'm Derek from Taffy Town. We're proud sponsors of the Other Side of Addiction podcast. Taffy Town is a family owned and operated business, still operating in the Salt Lake City area for over 100 years. We manufacture some of America's best saltwater taffy. What makes Taffy Town stand out from all of the others? We have a unique recipe, a whip style recipe that incorporates egg whites, evaporated milk, real sea salt. It's a unique product that is flavorful, melts in your mouth. And the best part is we probably have a flavor for anyone's um, liking, a flavor for any reason, for any season. Uh, we have unique flavors like chicken and waffles, maple bacon, frosted cupcake, Uh, New this year was a pineapple ghost pepper flavor. That's awesome. Where can people find out more about Taffy Town and all of its products? You can check all of this stuff out. All of our products are available uh, for sale on taffytown.com. We ship for free from our website, so all of our pricing on there is is shipping included. Uh, Oftentimes, we uh, offer special promotions and discounts to our loyal customers, so do be sure to sign up for an account. And we look forward to seeing what we can do to make you smile with our taffy. Where are you located? We are currently located at 9813 South Prosperity Road in West Jordan, Utah, just at the foothills of the Copper Canyon Mine. Derek, taffy has always been a great gift to give. What are some of the creative ways Taffy Town can help say thank you to others? Yeah, if, if you're looking for gift ideas, whether to say thank you to friends or family, or maybe to your clients after such a difficult or successful year that you've had, you could look no further than to get a gift idea from taffytown.com. We offer prepackaged gift boxes that say that it's saltwater taffy from the city of the Great Salt Lake, and it tells a little bit about the history of our community and making candy for so long. You can also do customized gifts to pick out just the right flavors or colors of candy for that special someone and deliver even a personalized message in that box to them. So please feel free to check out taffytown.com for any gift ideas this season. Thank you so much, Derek. Please visit taffytown.com, that's taffytown.com, to find out more about the products and services that Taffy Town offers. You won't be disappointed. Hello, my friends. This is Brad Newfeld. Thank you for tuning in to the Resilience Talk Network. You can listen to my show, Resilience, every morning, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. On my show, we will be discussing what it takes for you to overcome the day-to-day challenges that all of us seem to face in life, as well as some of those devastating ones that may lead us to feelings of either hopelessness or despair. It's my goal to provide you with the tools and skills that you need to overcome anything that is thrown your way. To find out more about the show, please visit our website at resiliencetalk.com. That's www.resiliencetalk.com. And as always, until we meet again, go for everything that you want in life and make it happen. And welcome back to Resilience. I'm your host, Brad Newfeld. What an interview uh, with Portia Lauder. Oh my gosh, people. I, I've been able to read the book as well. It's very touching, very touching. Uh, as, as Portia said, if you have somebody that's in the prison system or you know of somebody who has family members that are struggling with something like that, yeah, it can be very, uh, very traumatizing on both sides, both for the family members as well as the person that's in there. And again, as she said, and I'm by no means saying that uh, 
you know, uh, everybody that's in prisons are victims or whatnot. I mean, we have our justice system for a reason. However, sometimes we do things without really, uh, I mean, there's just no way to learn everything that's out there in this world. It's not necessarily written in books and you've got people that aren't necessarily the most honest out there who are trying to take advantage of people and, and things like that. And in our quest to do things for our families to better our lives and stuff. Sometimes we can fall into the wrong groups and, and be taken advantage of. And unfortunately it leads to places like uh, where Portia ended up in federal prison. And so, but uh, with her experience, she's able to bring a lot of things to light. And that's the, again, with the theme of our, our radio station here with being resilient, that's what we want to do here is help you get through those tough times of life. But back to this, uh, please order, look up her book. Uh, you'll be glad you did. It'd be a great Christmas gift as we got the Christmas season coming up. And you can put this uh, out there for, to give to your friends and family. But it's a, a very heartwarming story on how you can take something that happens negative in your life and turn it around and, and make a positive thing out of it. Uh, Portia didn't say a lot of the things that she's got going on in her life right now to be able to uh, spread the word on the wonderful things that she's learned, but she's really, uh, doors are opening for her that have never been there before. And it's just a beautiful thing to see, but I know the same thing can happen in your life. So never underestimate yourself. Always dig deep inside, ask yourself, who am I? Who, what are the things that I want? Cause I know darn well, those people who are listening to this show, they, they, uh, they're looking for more in their life. And guess what? you you have that desire and passion to do that for a reason. And I highly suggest you use it. Okay. Bring those talents out. You need it. The world needs it. Okay. Everything that you bring out that you can better your life will better your life, better your family's life and your community's life. And so never doubt that as Portia said, never, ever, ever give up. So that's our show for this week. Uh, please uh, tune in, tell your friends about us, the Resilience Talk Network. You can look up our website at resiliencetalknetwork.com. That's Resilience Talk Network. Dot com, or you can even look us up on Facebook with the same name. And so if you want to get a hold of me, if you'd like to be on our show, please give me a call at area code 435-830-6945. Once again, that's area code 435-830-6945. We'd love to hear your story. But until we meet again, go for everything that you want in life and make it happen. <laughs>